<laughs> All right, so we're going to be looking at two artists today. This is really the first time that we've been, that we're going to be looking, shh, shh, this is first, yeah, first time in two weeks we've had art history, but uh, this is the first time that we will be looking at two distinct artists instead of just looking at specific styles and specific time periods. Um, and we're going to see this more and more as we move forward in time, as we move forward into uh, different um, eras of art history, especially through the Renaissance, Baroque, etc. Um, the artist is going to become more and more important, uh, mostly because we just know about them, but also because specific artists are going to be seen as um, important less as, less as craftsmen and more as people to be sought after, people who are going to be looked to to uh, decorate churches later on, to be decorating homes and palaces. But in this period, we're just going to be looking at, at uh, artists who are going to be making devotional images. All right, so where are we? Um, this is our fun kind of timeline that we've been looking at. Um, we're in this transitional period, and there's not really a specific um, name for this time period, although there was an explosion of art, there was an explosion of design that was happening that's going to kind of predate the Italian Renaissance. Um, so this is this transitional period. It's known as the Trecento or the Quattrocento in Italian, which basically means the 1300s or the 1400s. Um, but when you say the Trecento, the, qu the Quattrocento, it's, it's, this is kind of that movement. This is kind of that, that stuff that's starting to develop. It's not quite medieval. It's not quite Gothic. It's not quite Renaissance. It's this transitional period that's happening in about this 100-year period right before the Renaissance itself really starts. So we're going to be looking, like I said, at, at two distinct artists. We saw last time we had art history, a couple of weeks ago, we saw kind of this movement away from this Byzantine style or this development of what's called this Italo-Byzantine style. And we looked at Duccio. Duccio is one of those artists that we looked at, greatly influenced by the Byzantine artists. Remember, a lot of Byzantine artists were coming over into Italy um, all throughout this period going all the way from you know, the early you know, mid-700s, 800s, and there was more and more Byzantine influence coming in to the Italian peninsula at this time. Um, and we're going to see a lot of that really start to take root and really start to influence the next movement. Right? So it's already been influential in, in Italy at the time, but it's going to start to, um, Italian artists during this time period are going to take that Byzantine style, take some of the medieval, take some of the Gothic, take all of these kind of different styles and kind of meld them into one unique style. So we're going to start with Cimabue. Uh, Cimabue, 1240 to 1302, he's square in the middle of this Trecento period. Um, he was very much influenced by Byzantine models, but he's regarded as one of the first great Italian artists to break away from that Italo-Byzantine style. Um, we're going to see that he, at the very beginning, is going to be very much influenced by the Byzantine style, but then he's going to start to slowly break away from it. He's not going to fully break away from it, but he's going to start to really kind of uh, move away from this Byzantine style. Yeah. Right. So why do, they, why do they do that? Because it's not meant to be realistic. It's so so Byzantine icons, right? What is what are the purpose of Byzantine icons? What are the purpose of Eastern icons? Even still today, where they're produced still today in the same in the same manner, they're meant as devotional images. They're meant to tell a story. They're not meant to be realistic. That's not. So if you say I don't like that, that's not realistic. That's fine. You can not like it, but you're kind of missing the point, right? You're so. You're, you're missing, it's not meant sure. to appeal to your senses, so to speak. It's meant to appeal to your faith. Um, and so, which is why it's, you know, there, there's wording here, right? You're showing different different persons here. It's it's not meant to just be super realistic. Yeah. yeah. Sure. What's that? I sure. Yeah. I don't offhand. Uh, I can look. I'll, I'll look at the end of class. So, which do you prefer? Do you prefer like, Byzantine like this, or do you prefer like, more? Yeah, I, I never really liked Byzantine, but the more I learn about it, the more I'm starting to learn more about it, um, the more I appreciate it. Still not my favorite, yeah. but I can appreciate it a lot more than I used to in the past. Right with like St. Francis. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna see why, because mm -hmm. the pe the people who are decorating the churches at this time, especially the Basilica of St. Francis. 
these guys. So that's why it's the cross of St. Francis. Okay. Um, you know what? Hold on. Give me one second. I'm going to... Saint Francis. Uh, I always forget his dates. Don't allow. So he was born 1182, and he died. Okay. So Francis of Assisi was born 1182, or, and died 1228. So he was born. Uh, he died shortly. Um, uh, shortly before Chimabui was, was born. So he's very much a, a contemporary of, of Chimabui. Um, so this style of crucifix that you're seeing, so Maria said, this, is, this looks like the, the cross of St. Francis. This was the style of crucifixes that was being developed in Italy just before this time. And so the vision that St. Francis had before the crucifix, it was a crucifix that looked very similar to this. It wasn't this one, but it was a crucifix that looked very similar. That's why we call it the St. Francis crucifix. It's it's that kind of Byzantine, early Italian Byzantine style. Yeah, Evan? Uh, I have a question, but I kind of was wondering this. How come every picture of Jesus is super muscular? Because he was the perfect man. Yeah, he was, he was meant to be the, the, perfect, the perfect human. So does that mean that he was ripped? Yeah. Does that mean he was ripped like the rock? No, not necessarily. It just means that he had, he had all, the, all the right kinds of muscles that you're supposed to have. No more, no less. Yep. Um, okay, so he was born in uh, he was born in Florence. He died in Pisa. Um, keep in mind things that are underlined on your handout are things you probably want to know. Um, uh, sorry, going back up real quick. The second bullet point: While medieval mar medieval art then was scenes and forms that appeared relatively flat and highly stylized, very much like Byzantine, Cimabue's figures were depicted with more advanced lifelike proportions and shading rather than other artists of his time. Um, okay, so what's what's going on with Cimabue? Why is he why is he important, and, and where did he come from? Born in Florence, died in Pisa. He traveled around quite a bit, um, and this is relatively new for artists. Most artists would stay in one place. They would be a craftsman. They would work under a master. They would set up shop, and this is you know they would spend their whole lives working for one patron or setting up shop. Cimabue is starting to move around. We're going to start to see artists who are moving around and kind of becoming sought after, sought after craftsmen to decorate certain churches or do commissions for certain places. Um, he, some people speculate that he could have been trained in Florence under masters who were connected to Byzantine art. It seems to make sense. We don't know. There's a lot about his early life that, that we don't know for sure. In fact, there's very few uh, artworks that are definitively attributed to, to Cimabue. Um, all the artwork that I'm going to show you, with the exception of one at the very end, we have actually no specific record for. This, these are all art historians. Well, we know he existed. We know he did stuff, but we can't specifically prove he did this one. These are art historians who are looking at this and going, this fits, right? Based on clues and based on the time period and based on when it was. So we know broadly where he was. We know when he traveled. We know that he was doing art. And so basically we're putting all those clues together and saying, right, this is who it was. It is, yep. Yeah, it's a, That big, I think. Yep. All right, so this one, uh, art historian attributes the crucifixion in the church of San Domenico in Arezzo to, to Cimabue, dating at around 1270. Um, this is one of the first known artworks that departs from the Byzantine style. It's still pretty similar to the Byzantine, Byzantine style, but it's, it's different. Um, the figure of Christ is bent instead of being flat. There's more movement, right? Even though Christ is, is dead in, in, or dying in this, um, he's showing him as more bent. There's also a lot more shading. And we see something interesting. The, the cloth that Christ is wrapped in, it's, it's in this red color. That's not too shocking. We've seen that before. But um, there's highlights. There's, there's shading. The highlights are in this gold. We haven't seen that before. We haven't seen a lot of that shading, a lot of that three-dimensionality. So we see Chimabui already starting to depart away from this kind of more flat uh, medieval slash Byzantine style. Around 1272, we know that he is being he is present in Rome, and he made another crucifix very very similar for the Florentine Church of San Croce in Rome. So, kind of a long story in and of itself, but various parishes would have their own little patron churches in another city, right? Uh, very not very common at all in in the United States, but that's what was happening 
um, back then. So if you were a Florentine, you would go and visit the Florentine church. Why? Well, this is the late 1200s. This is before Pius V in the 1500s. Okay, anyone know why you would want to have a Florentine church in Rome? Before Pius V, before the 1500s. Nope. Is there like kind of differences in the rights? Yep. There were differences in the rights based on where you were. There were different, there was the Florentine right, there was the Roman right, there was all these different rights. And so you would want to go to a liturgy that you were familiar with. And so when you were traveling in Rome, you would go to the Florentine Church of Rome because that's where the Florentine rite was being practiced. Uh, Pius V said, nope, we're standardizing all of it. No more of that. Uh, but that was why there's a Florentine church in Rome at the time. Yeah. So is it was like by when you like write, you mean like the masses? The, the mass. Yep, the mass. Um, so was all perfectly valid. Canon was essentially the same. Offertory was very much the same. But they would do, they would have different feast days. They would have different slight different rubrics. If you go to a Benedictine Mass or a Dominican Mass still today, um, those are slightly different rites. The Confidior is slightly different. So in, for instance, in the Dominican Rite, um, they say to confess Almighty God, Blessed Mary, Ever Virgin, and to our Blessed Father, Dominic, and to Blessed Apostles, Peter and Paul. So Confidior is slightly different, even still today. So there were slight variations. It wasn't hugely different. Yeah, yep, that's the Benedictine Rite. Yep, but they followed the, the ancient Benedictine rite. So Pius V left some of these. So seniors, you learned a little bit about this in liturgy last year. Juniors, we'll get to it in liturgy next year. Um, Pius V basically left some of the liturgies intact. If, if they had been in existence for two or 300 years, I forget exactly. I think it was 200, 300. I don't remember. Um, he left those in existence, said those can continue. But during this time period, which we're talking about here, there was an explosion of different rites. So basically, every city had its own little rite. They were all valid. They were all per perfectly fine. Um, nothing bad, nothing modernist, but it was very different in a lot of different places. Anyway, that's kind of the, the, the backstory as to why there's a Florentine chapel in Rome. Um, but he was born in Florence, and so the, uh, the pastor, so to speak, the people who were in charge of this Florentine chapel said, here, come, come paint a crucifix. And we see some similarities here, right? He has a style. He has a definite style that he's sticking to. Um, it's been restored it was damaged by the uh, flood, 1966. But um, we think maybe he collaborated with Nicola Pisano on this. Nicola Pisano, he's the one who did that baptistry that we looked at in Pisa. Um, we think that maybe they collaborated on some of this. There was this starting to be this collaboration among a lot of artists during this time period as well. They're sharing ideas. They're sharing concepts, right? Like exactly the same, though, just not yeah, right. So. That's why we're able to very much attribute it to, to Chimabui. But there are some differences, right? Instead of, it, instead of it being kind of more technicolor, it's more natural looking, right? There's this kind of slow progression, even though this is only a few years later. It is nice, yeah. Uh, this is probably one of the most famous works of his. Around 1280, he painted this. This is called the Maista, or the Maista, accent mark. Um, and this is um, essentially an altarpiece. So this would go uh, basically above the tabernacle in an altar. Um, and it is, uh, other pictures I'm going to show you where I, where I zoom in, it's, it's going to be a little more difficult to tell. But the whole background and the halos are all gelt. It's gold, gold leaf. Um, so what he's doing is he's painting on wood panel. He's painting with probably tempera, which is an egg paint, egg yolk base paint. And then he's overlaying uh, gelt o over top of it after he's done. Uh huh. So, or is it yep. So after the, he's done with everything, then he puts down a little bit of like a varnish, essentially, puts down the gold leaf, and then lifts the gold leaf up. And where he's painted the varnish, the gold leaf sticks. Is that like a characteristic that we know like doing the, like the gold shadows almost? This is yeah. This is starting to be a little bit of a hallmark of his. And other artists right afterwards are going to very much copy what he's doing. So using using gold as a shadow. Um, it's not the main characteristic of Chimabui, but it's, it's definitely one of them. So good eye. Yep. Um, so according to Vasari, Chimabui, while traveling from Florence to another town, came upon a 10-year-old Giotto on the back of your page, Giotto, um, drawing a sheep with a rough rock upon a smooth stone. He asked if Giotto would like to come and stay with him, which the child accepted with the father's permission. Vasari, we're, we're going to hear more about Vasari. We'll talk about him a little bit later. Vasari elaborates that during Giotto's apprenticeship, he allegedly painted a fly on the nose of a portrait that Chimabu was working on. 
The teacher attempted to sw sweep the fly away several times before he understood the pupil's prank. Right, so Giotto is going to be studying with Cimabue from all records that we know. Now, Vasari, uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about him. Vasari was a biographer. He was a biographer. He started to write a lot about the, the lives of the artists um, during this time period. Um, he was actually alive during the 1500s, but he's gathering together all these writings. And so it's because of Vasari, uh, he wrote a book called The Glorious Lives of the Artists. Um, Vasari was the reason why we know a lot about these artists during this time period. Vasari, by the way, he is the one who coined the term Gothic because he hated the Gothic uh, period. He thought it was barbaric, so he attributed, right? We talked about that. That's that same guy. Um, very important in, in art history, but you take what he says with a little bit of a grain of salt. Is this a true story about the fly? We don't know. Um, but in, in either case, Chimbui and Giotto are starting to work together. So this is the Maesta. Um, what's that? Best friends. Best friends. Uh, originally dis displayed in the Church of San Francisco in Pisa. Um, this is going to be a work that's going to influence a lot of artists uh, following him as well. Um, so what's going on in this? Why is it interesting? Why is it important? Well, first let's look at what it is. Obviously it's, it's Our Lady seated holding the infant. We have angels around her. She's seated on a throne. Again, very medieval type, you know, typography of, of showing Mary. Uh, we have four Old Testament prophets down on the bottom. It's um, Isaiah, Jacob, Jonah. I don't remember. I don't remember exactly who all is in there. But, all right, so still kind of flat, but we're starting to see, again, some of this shading, some of this, some of this detail work that we haven't seen before in Those other. Like all small lines. Yeah. So he's using almost kind of like a cross-hatching pattern using that varnish and then applying the gold leaf to it. Whoa. We see a lot more three-dimensionality. We see a lot more shading. We see the figures are not exactly straight on. We start to see a turn of the head. We start to see a little bit more emotion with some of the prophets, right? They're kind of looking at each other almost like they're ticked off at each other. They're not, but what's that? Faces are pretty Yeah. Why do they look at each other? I don't know. I I think they're meant to be more serious. <coughs> yeah. Um, I thought this was a crown, or the, I thought this was a church on his head is actually a crown. It, so there, there are some things that are not exactly perfect, right? The perspective, not perfect. But we start to see some of this, right? In art terms, we call this, you know, if you take an art class with Mrs. Root or whatever, they're going to say this is called violating a boundary, right? So there's a boundary. This is a step. The foot is supposed to stay on the step, but that's, that foot is moving forward. So it's giving us the impression of three-dimensional space. They haven't really quite figured out perspective yet, but they're starting to play with it. Chimbu is starting to play with this idea of perspective. Oh, and he's doing an OK job at it, right? These lines, you know, this line should be moving more this way to go towards a vanishing point. He's not quite doing it perfectly well, right? These lines aren't lining up. But he's, we're starting to see this development of, of perspective um, Wait, was it the Byzantine that had the red shoes? Yeah, some of them did, uh, but it just depends on. It, a lot of that depends on the style of the day as well. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was Byzantine, but again, that was more just kind of the style of the day that they're bringing into the artwork that they're doing. How big is it? Do you think? Okay. Um, so this would go above an altar, so maybe it's about four feet tall. So not super tall. Um, He's also doing, um, so he's doing a few other similar works. This is another one he's doing, this is called the flagellation. This is a, um, this is actually a mosaic that he did and then he didn't like it so he painted over it, um, called the flagellation. This is in the baptistry in Florence. So he's again moving around to all these different places. Um, and again, it's still pretty flat. Perspective is still not quite there. Right, we have kind of this weird idea that they're just kind of floating in some sort of three-dimensional space, but we have a lot more realism, a lot more shading. The figures are still a lot elongated, but we start to see emotion in the faces uh, that we haven't seen before. Again, we're not really seeing this. We, we started to see emotion in faces in, in carvings and in statuary, but we didn't really see it as much in painting. So this is this kind of all of a sudden this explosion, this development of two-dimensional art during the time. He did another Maesta in Bologna. He did a Madonna. 
in Castel Fiorentino, which is just outside of Florence. So again, he's, he's getting some fame, and he's not making a ton of money, but he's getting a lot of fame, and, and people are calling him to come and, and decorate their chapels and their altars. Was it the green undertone? Yeah, so that's, that's underpainting. Um, so you would do, you do the, the opposite color. So if you look at a color wheel, you do the opposite color underneath, and then you cover it with the color that you actually want to color, uh, and that creates a lot of depth. And so if you leave a little bit you know, if you leave, leave a little bit of um, transparency, that helps to create a shadow. Over time, this top layer is kind of faded a little more than it should, or than, than it was when he painted it. So that's why we're seeing some of these green tints. So if you see all of a sudden like a blue tint or a green tint, it's like, why was that there? It's underpainting, and that's done on purpose. Uh, if you mix colors together, it creates a lot more vibrancy than just having one color by itself. I remember when I was taking an oil painting class, um, I painted, we we're just supposed to do a still life, just an apple on a shelf with a black background. Um, and so I painted the background black. And it was just a black sheet of paper, and then the apple was on a, on a, basically on a table right up against the black background. And then I painted the apple, and then I realized, oh, I already painted the background black. I have no ability to put a shadow on now because the light's coming towards the apple. How do I do a shadow? So my, my oils teacher came by and said, mix red and green. Okay, so I did. He goes, now paint the shadow with red and green. And it was this kind of muddy brown. I'd already applied the black. Then I take that red-green mixture with the brown, and it turned into this deeper, darker black. And I was like, that's amazing. He goes, yeah, you just discovered overpainting and underpainting and color theory. I was like, that, so that's what he's doing. That's, that's so cool. Yeah, so there's all those little things that these artists are starting to figure out at this time. You start to mix colors that don't really seem to make sense. Why would you paint a shadow muddy brown? Well, it works if you already have a black background. I should have why you would do like pink. It just doesn't make any Yeah. And why do these geos look so like disproportionate? Again, it's it's not perfect, yeah, right? We're used to seeing we're used to seeing, you know, art from the Renaissance, from the Baroque, where people look kind of perfect. They're still trying to figure a lot of that stuff out. Yeah. I can't do it either. They're still they're like early phases. Yeah, very much in the early phases. Uh Chimbui, flagellation, um sorry, the this is the Maesta with St. Francis and St. Dominic. We start to see St. Francis appearing, right? Um, this one is now in the Uffizi in, in Florence. We see St. Francis. We were just talking about canonizations yesterday. Um, this is only about 40 years after Francis's death. He's already canonized, right? There was not that official process yet for St. Francis. The people just acclaimed him as a saint. Was that? Yeah. Um, they're, he's just working through different different styles, different ideas. All right, so he travels to Assisi. Um, pope Nicholas the IV uh, became the pope in the late 1200s, and he was the first Franciscan pope. We've already looked at the Basilica of Saint Francis of Assisi a little bit. Um, this is the lower chapel. This is the first chapel done in in um, that kind of baroque. Uh, it's not baroque. Done in that Romanesque Gothic style. Um, this is an older picture, but I wanted to show you kind of all the damage and the challenges that, that art restorers have. Um, how do you restore that? Yeah, right, it's, it's going to be pretty difficult. You, you can restore this a little anymore. bit. Yeah. Um, the lower chapel of Assisi, it's, it's a fairly wet area of, of Italy. There's a lot of rain. There's a lot of humidity. Um, when you're walking around there, it's, it's like walking around Dallas. Not the heat that um, Right. And so it's very wet. These walls are, are very porous, um, and frescoes suffer quite a bit when there's a lot of moisture. Uh, but he's in Assisi, and he's asked to, um, to decorate the transept, so these, these areas, these walls, in the lower basilica of St. Francis. And to get across the idea of how well, so previous artists, when, when they were told, all right, paint the Madonna, paint this saint, paint this person, they would generally just go, all right, I'm just going to paint this person. Again, to your point, Ellie, from earlier, we don't really care about the realism. We care about what we're trying to get across. It's not meant to be realistic. It's meant to be, or maybe it was Evan. I don't remember who said it. Um, we're, not, we're not trying to get across specifically the realism of the person. We're trying to get across the devotion towards the person. But it's here while he's in Assisi that he's really starting to develop 
a lot more naturalism in his, in his paintings, a lot more realism in his paintings. So this is called Madonna with Child Enthroned, Four Angels, and St. Francis, dating from 1280. So St. Francis dies 12, what did I say? I think 1228, something like that. So this is within 50 years of his death, meaning there were people in this convent, in this monastery, who were still alive, who were able to tell Ch Chimabui what St. Francis looked like. And so Chimabui is painting St. So Francis, and he actually asked monks of the Franciscan order to come and help him. Obviously, there's no photographs. People weren't really making a lot of drawings. So they were kind of coaching him as he was, it's kind of like a police sketch artist, what he was doing. Uh, and so this is probably the most realistic portrait of St. Francis that we have. This is probably pretty close to what he looked like because Chimabui is painting with the help of monks who knew him, obviously older monks. They were in their 70s or 80s, but they were able to describe what St. Francis looked like. Uh, and so this is, sometimes you'll see this, this picture of St. Francis. This is probably what he looked like. He was very short. He was very skin, uh, skinny. He had, he's very skinny. Um, <laughs> but remember, he was, he, was, um, he was fasting his entire life. He was, he was not giving into any of his passions of, of eat or drink or anything like that. There, he would go for days without food at times. And so it, it makes sense. They have restored it. Uh, back to what it looked like originally, and so this is what that that panel looks like. So Saint Francis is not the most not the most attractive guy, but a great saint, obviously. Um, <laughs> during the same time, he's doing all of these panels. So he's doing a lot of these panels here in the in the lower chapel, and uh, and this is where he gets a lot of his fame. Um, you can see here, all, this one is absolutely damaged, and you can see the underpaint here. The, the upper, the top layer of fresco has basically just all peeled away. They're trying to figure out, do we restore it? Do we not? I don't, I don't remember where they are in this process now. Uh, this picture is a couple years old, but just to kind of give you an idea. There's also a lot of earthquakes. I don't, I'm not 100% familiar with this painting. So they started to restore St. Francis at the foot of the cross, and I think they stopped. Um, I don't remember exactly what the story is, but you can, you can see how even the lower layer of the fresco is, has fallen away now. How come St. Francis has a lot of this stuff? This is in the Basilica of St. Francis. Um, so sad, uh, finally, we'll look at the, um, the last work that Chimabui did. Um, and this is a mosaic. This is the only mosaic that we know of that he did. Uh, this is in... I thought he did the other one that's painted over. He did, but, but we don't... It's all painted over, so they don't want to take it off. Um, but this is the only existing mosaic that we know he did. And actually, we think that he collaborated with uh, a couple other people on this, but we know that he did this. We know that he did the, the, the mosaic of St. John the Evangelist. And in fact, this is the only official record of an artwork that we have by Cimabui, uh, because we have bank records, essentially, uh, that show uh, the person who commissioned this giving him money, and it's written on the receipt for the St. John the Evangelist mosaic. This is the only hard evidence we have, although we're 99% sure that everything else that I showed you is, is in fact, his. Um, I think I mentioned this before, Chimbui. This was a, uh, this is a small panel painting about this big on wood panel hanging over a grandmother's stove in France. She bought it at an antique shop. Um, and turns out, same story. <laughs> same story. Uh, turns out it was a work by Chimabui. They were able to kind of track it down and figure out where it was. Art historians have looked at it, and it sold for $26.8 million. $26.8 million. <coughs> no, he, she sold it. I don't remember who she sold it to. It sold at auction. It's in a private collection now. But I think she died like two years later. So her kids are like, oh, darn. Sorry. Uh, Giotto. I uh, spent a long time on Chimbu. I didn't think I would. Uh, Giotto. Uh, this is one of the only portraits that we have of him. Um, he was, again, we think that he, we think that he worked with, um, with Chimabui, but he was at the very least influenced by him if he didn't work with him already. Um, Giotto is really seen as the one who brings about this idea of realism. He is the one who's kind of this transition point between, between Gothic, between medieval, and between Renaissance. All right, so what is he doing? He, he was a polymath, right? He was a polymath, which means um, 
what we would call today a Renaissance man. He was one of the original Renaissance men, like, like da Vinci. Um, he was an architect and a painter. He gets a lot more emphasis for his paintings, but he designed the Campanile, or the bell tower, in Florence. So this is that cathedral of Florence that we've seen. Um, so the baptistry, seniors, we talked about the, the baptistry doors, right? We talked about the dome, but we've already talked, uh, talked about the building. Giotto did this Campanile. Um, so an extraordinary artist. Um, he is best known for this chapel. This is the Scroveni Chapel in Padua. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but why are there these names for some of these chapels? Uh, well, when a, when a church is being built, uh, a wealthy family will give a certain amount of money, and they will essentially pay for the construction, the materials of this chapel. So the abbot or the pastor or whoever, the bishop, is going to say, hey, we need to build this chapel. We're looking for people to help fund it. Will you give X amount of money for a pew, a stained glass window? And some wealthy families will say, I'll pay for a whole side chapel. So this is the Scroveni family's chapel. It wasn't theirs, but it's named after them. And so they were able to hire the artist. They were able to say, this is what we want in this chapel. And so they hired this up-and-coming artist named Giotto, Giotto de Bandoni. How much do you think that would cost? Today? Yeah. To do it exactly like that? To, yeah, like to pay... To pay <clears throat> well, to give you rough, rough idea, the, the brand new church that the SSPX is building in, in, uh, in St. Mary's, that just hit $40.2 million. So to do one of the side chapels, a million? Even like with all of that painting? Yeah, maybe a little more, maybe a million, two million. I mean, very roughly. So not an insignificant sum of money. Um, so yeah, so this is Crovani Chapel. Uh, very narrow, very difficult to get into, um, but this was really Giotto's masterwork. So. <clears throat> this? Oh, this is for when people are coming in to tour the chapel. What so, that, so they will do mass here every now and then, but not as often. Now it's more like a. But why are the railings? Is it like drop on the side or something? No, it's to keep it, keep people from touching the frescoes. Uh, so you can't you can't get super close to it. Um, so this was completed about 1305, and uh, the Scrivani people are the Scrivani family is in there. There's 37 different panels. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of them, but this is, oh this is a view of you know, six out of the 37 panels. And it's all depicting various events in the life of Christ, right? Um, we see, obviously, the Last Supper. We see the resurrection, right? This is called the Nole Me, me, me Tandre, right? Don't touch me. Mary, don't touch me. Um, this is the, the raising of Lazarus, right? Various events throughout the life of Christ. And... This is actually, none of, that is, none of that is stone, none of that is marble. This is all one flat panel, and he's subdividing it up into, into six different panels. All right, so like I said, if things are underlined, know them, right? Giotto's important. Giotto's important because he's this important transitional figure, and this is where we start to see a lot of the importance of the Renaissance starting to move forward. So unlike those by Cimabue, Giotto's figure, figures are not stylized or elongated. Right? So Chimabu is starting to bring about some of this, some of this realism, but Giotto is really going to make more of an emphasis on it. So you can look. Some of the figures, the figures are solidly three-dimensional. How is he doing that? He's doing that by showing shadows, by showing weight. Right? You can see the back. You can see the, the weight of the elbow. Right? You see how these people... What is that? Uh, this is the... The crowning with thorns, a very stylized version of the crowning with thorns. That does not look like Jesus. Um, a lot of the figures have emotional faces and gestures, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this stuff as we look at this one, but then keep these keep these ideas in mind as we're looking through the other ones. Emotional faces and gestures that are based on close observation. They're not clothed in swirling, formalized drapery. Think back to what we just looked at with Chimabui, right? This drapery that almost kind of looks stiff, right? There, were those, there was that cross-hatching, there was that highlight and shadow that he was doing, but it was still very two-dimensional. It's two colors, right? He's not mixing a bunch of different colors with, with paint. Some of it he was, but it still looks kind of stiff. It still looks kind of like just like a, almost like a tarp, right? Whereas look at the clothing here. It's, it's flowing. There's a, lot more, um, there's a lot more weight behind it. Uh, so garments that hang naturally and have a lot more form and weight. He also took bold steps in foreshortening. So what is foreshortening? Uh, if you're 
if I'm holding my hand out to you and you have to paint that in a way that doesn't make it look weird, right? That my hand is pointing towards you, it's, it's really difficult to do, right? It's easy to do that. It's a lot more easy to, to paint like this compared to something coming at you in three-dimensional space. And Giotto is really going to be uh, experimenting with a lot more of that, yeah. Um, the figures occupy compressed settings. So these are small settings because of, you know, he's dividing these up into panels, but he's often using perspective devices so that they resemble stage sets. It almost looks like these various like kind of figures or stages that we're looking at. And he's also arranging the figures in such a way that the viewer appears to have a particular place and even an involvement, right? In some of these, yeah, you do feel like you're, there's a plane, but in some of them, you kind of feel like you're in on the action. And he's the first one who's going to start to kind of invite us into the action of a painting instead of it really being that, that two-dimensional space. Um, in theater, they call it breaking the fourth wall. Right? That's when uh, one of the actors goes and turns to the audience and goes, OK, so here's what happens next. Right? That's breaking the fourth wall. So Giotto's kind of going to start to do that. None of the figures are really looking directly at us. We're going to see that a little bit later in some of the later artists. But Giotto is going to start to kind of break down that fourth wall a little bit more. Right? Again, fourth wall. One, two, three. This is the fourth wall. And he's breaking it. So I'm going to be mentioning that more and more as we go forward. Again, this one's a little bit more damaged. They haven't restored this one as much. But again, these figures. He's still using some gold. He's still using some gold leaf. Um, but there's a lot more action. There's a lot more emotion. There's a lot more drama. Right? This, these arms, these figures, right? You can see the highlight. The, sh the highlight is hitting here, so it looks three-dimensional. Yep. Um, this is his most famous work. This is called The Lamentation. This is one of the panels in the Scrivani Chapel called The Lamentation. You're definitely going to want to know this, right? Uh, so The Lamentation. Why is it good? Why is it important? This is a zoomed-in view of it. But the first thing that we notice is the emotion on the faces, right? There's a lot of emotional faces. Um, the women are crying. We see a lot of three-dimensionality, right? The shading and the highlights on the, on the bodies of the figures. Another thing that I mentioned earlier, this idea that in previous times, you would never turn your back. You would never turn your back. A, a, an artist would never paint a figure with its back turned to the audience. That's a huge no-no. You never did that. Giotto's going to start to do that. Why? Because this is what the scene looked like. He's not doing it to paint a scene because this is how it should be painted. He's trying to invite us into the scene to make us feel like we are standing right behind this woman here because that's what she would have been doing, right? It's kind of funny when you see a play or you see a movie and people are having dinner. They're all having dinner on one side of the table, right? It's not. It kind of makes sense when you see it, but it doesn't make sense if you really start to think about it. No one's actually going to be doing that. Was that how the Last Supper was? Yeah, that's why the Last Supper is like that, right? And then later artists are going to start to experiment with different things too. But Giotto was one of the first ones to really start to do this. All right, we're zoomed out here, and we see all these figures. The emotion, kind of this fluttering of, of, these, of these wailing angels. But there's another thing that's really important in this. And he used what's called a compositional device. A compositional device. This is something that helps us to understand what the painting is. It doesn't mean that it's like a symbol or a secret hidden something, but it's something in the painting that draws, us, draws our eye towards what we're supposed to be looking at. What am I talking about? What is it in the painting that's drawing our eye? The rock. And what is it doing? To where? Christ's face. It's subtle. You, you may not notice that that's what it's doing, but that's what it's doing. He's very smart. He understands that he's, if he's going to put in this diagonal and our eye is going to immediately go towards it, so it's, drawing to it's drawing our attention. And so artists are going to take this. This seems like just a rock. This isn't a rock. This is, I don't think I'm really overstating it when I say this is a revolution in art what this rock does. Because artists have not really done this before. He's taking just a simple rock, just a simple backdrop. And yeah, it's adding space. It's adding three-dimensionality. The mountains in the background are, don't look as good as they should be. They were probably painted a little bit better. But he's using something to really guide us. To, the artist is telling us where to look, essentially. Look here. And then, and then where does our eye go next? Back up from where Christ is looking to here. 
And then we have this, again, another device. This is on purpose. This is another device that he's using to draw our eyes over to these guys. Right? So basically, our eyes are, are moving in this, in this pattern, and he's doing it on purpose because that's how he wants us to view this painting. It's like, it's like an author giving us an introduction, then a body, then a conclusion. That's exactly what he's doing with a painting. But he's doing it using, um, using lines and shapes. Um, on one end of the Scrivening Chapel, he does what is often done in a lot of chapels. Uh, the Last Judgment, we're going to see this over and over again in, in other chapels. Um, and we don't have a lot of time to go through it, but this whirling, swirling realm of demons and, and, uh, on one side and, and the church triumphant on the other. Mm -hmm. Here's another example of the Scrivani Chapel. There's another panel, and he's using the same sort of device here. Right? So not only is he using the rock, but he's using the angel. The angel, and your eye goes down here. Right? The first thing you may notice is the angel because it's kind of bright and it's on this dark background. But then we immediately go down here to see St. Saint, uh, Saint Joseph sleeping. Very quickly, we're just going to go through the Basilica of St. Francis. Just after Chimabui was doing his work in the Basilica of St. Francis, uh, Giotto was invited to come up to the upper chapel to do a series of frescoes depicting St. Francis. And so he does various frescoes. And he's doing the same sort of thing, right? These very naturalistic um, scenes, these scenes that are a lot more realistic than what we've seen just about 20 to 30 years before. So it, it's, it's interesting if you ever have the opportunity to go into, uh, to go to Assisi, which I'd recommend you do at some point in your life because it's, it's a great experience. Um, from an art perspective, go look at the paintings of Chimabui and then go upstairs and look at the paintings of Giotto. They were done 20 to 30 years differently, uh, 20, 20 to 30 years apart, but they're done in a very different style. And this is how fast things are moving during this Trecento, Quattrocento period uh, in Italy. Uh, we see the, this scene from the life of St. Francis where he basically renounces his, uh, all of his inheritance from his father and the bishop is, is clothing him. Again, Perspective still not great, right? We, we aren't really going to get to a very good perspective. We aren't going to really going to get to good mathematical perspective until we hit the Renaissance itself with, you know, Da Vinci and Michelangelo and all that kind of stuff. But they're starting. They're getting there. Uh, but the realism is there. The figures are still stiff, a little bit, but again, uh, getting there quite a bit more. Saint Francis again selling a lot of what he, uh, a lot of what he owns. This is Saint Francis going to request uh, the establishment of the order of the Franciscan order. And then you've probably seen this one or a very similar depiction of St. Francis with, um, you know, with the animals. Uh, this is, again, not super realistic. He didn't, it's funny, Chimabui cared more about the face. Giotto cared more about the environment, right? Chimabui was like, you know, I'm going to paint St. Francis as he actually was. Chimabui was like, I'm just going to paint him as a random guy. I know he had a beard. I know he had the, I know he had the tonsure, but I'm going to paint this, the scene. All right, um, just real quickly, we're going to look at one other work that <clears throat> Giotto did. And again, Giotto was, uh, there was no rivalry between Giotto and Cimabue. In fact, Giotto was very appreciative of what Cimabue had taught him and, and what he did. Um, but he's going to take these same ideas. Remember, we looked at the Maista of Cimabue. This is going to be a direct correlation. So he was asked to paint an altarpiece. Um, this is in, I think it's in Florence, yep, it was in Florence. Um, and so he was asked to paint an altarpiece, and he basically took what Cimabue had did with his Maista, and he said, all right, I'm going to take the same idea, but I'm going to develop it a little bit further. And so he does. We have a lot more three-dimensionality of the figures. Um, instead of having just four angels, two on each side, kind of floating around, we have this kind of uh, audience this, of, of all of these saints, uh, virgins, bishops, widows, and then the angels are kneeling down. They're solidly on the ground, right? So we see this development. And then finally, uh, it's great because in the Uffizi Gallery, these three paintings, these three altarpieces uh, that we've looked at. So we looked at, we looked at Duccio actually last class. This is the Maestro that we saw earlier this class. And then this is the one that we just saw from Giotto. And you can see the development in this period of this 26 year period, um, how it's really going to be advancing. Chimabui was the one who really kicked this all off. Duccio, not a lot of advancement, and then Chimabui. Um, but it is cool because they, they have these all three side by side by side in the Uffizi, so you can really see what's going on.
Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. So you said uh, Giotto, he was more of like the um, environment, or was he more of the figures? He was, so he was definitely more about the figures and the emotion, um, but I think it was before you came, maybe it was before you came in, but Chimbui was, did a portrait of St. Francis, and he really worked hard, and he talked with monks who were alive, who knew St. Francis. Yes. Okay, so he didn't care so much about what St. Francis looked like. He was more caring about the the realism of the scene. Okay.